Join us virtually on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock a.m. as we come together in prayer during this season of holy consecration, seeking God's face. All are welcome to join us on Wednesdays in March for virtual morning Bible study at 10 a.m. All are welcome to join us on Wednesdays in March for virtual evening Bible study at 7 p.m. All 7th through 12th grades and college students are invited to join us on Sunday, April 2nd at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. All are invited to join us on Friday, April 7th at noon for our Good Friday service. Join us on Sunday, April 9th for one of our two services at 7.30 a.m. and 11 a.m as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. The Intentional Academic Ministry will offer tutoring classes beginning today. Classes offered are math, English, science, and foreign languages. Children up to age 10, too, are invited to celebrate Easter at MEBC on Saturday, April 1st from 9.30 a.m. until noon. There will be craft stations, an Easter egg hunt, games, music, food, and more. Space is limited, so register at mountenan.org today. Mount Enon's Food Pantry has expanded its food distribution efforts as a distribution site for the Emergency Food Assistance Program, TFAP. On Saturday, April 15th, from 10 a.m. until noon, we will have a drive through contactless food distribution. Volunteers are needed. Recipients will be required to complete a demographic brief survey. Praise the Lord. Come on, praise the Lord, church. Is there anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? Good morning, family. Good morning. How's everyone? Certainly just want to welcome all of you this morning, both online and present with us in this sanctuary. We're certainly grateful uh, for your presence. We know you could have chosen to be anywhere this morning, but you've chosen to be here at Mount Eden, and so we're grateful for your presence on this morning and excited and joyful for what God is getting ready to do. Quickly just want to announce a few things that uh, we're doing. Uh, our prayer counselors will be stationed at the front of the church immediately after service for those who desire prayer. Also join us virtually on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. as we come together in prayer during this season of holy consecration, seeking God's face, 6 a.m. each Wednesday. And also, children up to the age of 10 are invited to celebrate Easter 
on Saturday, April 1st from 9.30 a.m. to noon, from 9.30 a.m. to noon, April 1st. And there will be craft stations, an Easter egg hunt, games, music, food, and so much more. Space is limited, though, so register at MountEden.org today. Well, I just have one question for you this morning. Did you come to worship this morning? Did you come to give God some praise this morning? Because this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Did anybody come in today with a heart of joy this morning for a new day that God has created for me and for you and for us? And we ought to give God some praise because he is worthy of all praise. Let us pray. Gracious and all loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time and service. And God, right now we ask that you just throw your weight around. Let your spirit marinate in this place. God, charge this atmosphere with your presence. Have your way. Do only what you can do. Touch our pastor. Touch our leaders. Touch our musicians. Touch our singers. Touch our choir. God, thank you for all the things that you're doing. And God, we thank you in advance for all the great things that you're getting ready to do. And so we lift up this prayer in the greatest person that we know, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. And would you do me a favor? You've been standing and sitting next to your neighbor for all of this time. Would you just look at them real quick and smile and say hello? All right. Good morning, Mount Eden. If you will remain standing as we notice our hymn for this morning, just a little talk with Jesus. First one. I was lost in tears, but Jesus took but me in. Jesus took me a little light from heaven filled my soul. this morning 
if you may be dealing with some problems or issues, that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Come on.
is there anybody willing to wait on God? At Mount Eden, we are a praying church because we believe that the prayers of the righteous avail us much. And so at this time, if it's your desire, we invite you down to the altar so we may be in prayer together as a body. Feel free to come now towards the altar so we may feel the power of God. And particularly, I'm praying for those of us who may be in a season of feeling stuck. Perhaps you feel as if you don't know what the next step is. You feel trapped in some patterns and some habits that you've been trying to get free from for a while. Some change that you're trying to get unloosed from. And so we come together in this moment to break every chain and to remind us that there's power even when you feel powerless. So don't be afraid to come now in prayer together. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, we come now first thanking you. Because God, despite all the things we may be dealing with and facing, you're still God. And because you're still God, what we're facing is less powerful than you. And so God, we adore you right now. We lift you up, we praise you. And God, we stand grateful for the life that's in our body. God, we stand grateful for the gift of another day. Grateful just to be in your presence. Because before anybody else saw us, you saw us. And you marveled at us and said we were good. And God, right now, there are some who are just experiencing heaviness. Who are dealing with hardships after hardships after hardships. Who are dealing with situations that just seem insurmountable. Places that seem inescapable. God, right now, there are some who are just struggling to sense who they are anymore. Tear-stained pillows. Thoughts that are just riddled with guilt and shame. Traumas that just keep showing up over and over again. Pain and wounds that hurt deeply. God, there, there are some who are just struggling to see the light right now. Struggling to see the next step. Who, who are struggling to see the possibilities because limitation is all they know right now there are some who just feel that they have reached the end and just want to give up but God in this moment we call out to you just to remind them that there is another side to what's going on God right now we ask you to remind us that breakthroughs are still possible. God, remind us that possibilities are still around us. God, remind us that there is a future for us that you have already built for each one of us. 
God, remind us that you have the blueprint in your hand and that we can't stop coming to you. God, help someone today know that today is not the day to give up, but that they can keep moving forward. They can keep pushing through. They can go to new levels. That There are destinies for them to walk through. There are open doors for them to go through. And God, let us even discern when there are closed doors not to go back to. over us and guiding and leading us. And right now, God, we even pray for forgiveness. God, forgive us for not seeing us ourselves in the way that you see us. Forgive us for not loving others in the way that others need to be loved because we haven't even loved ourselves appropriately. God, forgive us for not living lives that are healthy for us, but living in unhealthy ways. God, help us ultimately to see that even though we may have moments where we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there, and because you are there, life is there. Help us to remember that no weapons, while they may form, won't prosper. Help us to remember, God, that you give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. And so while we may not understand this moment, God, we know that peace is still available, God. We know that joy is still available, God. We know that love is still available, God, because, God, you're always available. And you're never off the clock. And so right now, God, we are praising you in advance for the breakthroughs that are getting ready to come. We are praising you in advance for the miracles that are on their way, God. We are praising you in advance for the good reports and the good news because, God, we know that your spirit is being poured upon us, God, and, and, and chains are being broken right now. So have your way, oh God. Do only what you can do because, God, we've come too far to give up right now. We've come too far to stop right now. So we lift you up, we praise you, we magnify you, we glorify you just because you're you. So we lift up this prayer we offer to you this morning. In your name, the name that holds all power. In your name, that makes demons tremble. In your name, that turns situations around. Jesus and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. And amen. your hands together. Give the Lord praise today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing today and we are glad in it. I don't know about you, but I am so excited to be in the house of the Lord today. We bless God for all of our guests and visitors who are worshiping with us today. You are at the right place at the right time. Church, can you help me to welcome our online campus to everyone online? Shout out to you. We bless God for each and every one of you. I want to ask all of our new disciples if you have completed your new discipleship class and are in need of receiving the right hand of fellowship, you can come down to the front now and face the congregation. Uh, all of our new disciples who have completed your classes, amen. As they are coming, as they are coming, I want to let you know that today, following today's service, we have free and confidential HIV AIDS testing 
uh, today. It'll be conducted by a health uh, department professionals that we're partnering with today. Uh, and so listen, uh, we've got to break the stigma on HIV AIDS in our community and in the church. Amen. Three people. Okay, listen, you know what you're doing when you're not in the church. Amen. And so we need to know our status. Amen. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, know your status. Amen. Know your status. Amen. This is, let's know our status. Amen. And so we're going to have free and confidential HIV AIDS screening in the Harambe wing of the church. Just go out of the doors to my right and your left. It's free. It's confidential. Amen. So let's make sure we do that today. It is a joy to welcome into this church these new disciples. Praise the Lord. I want to say to each of you, we are so thrilled that the Lord led you to partner with us in ministry. And I want to say to you that as you've been drawn and as you've been, oh, wow, we got to bless the Lord for those who join online too. Amen. They were online. Praise God. Yep. Uh, as you've been drawn, as you've been developed, we now deploy you to reproduce yourselves. Look, I don't want you to be content with just coming to service. Members are just satisfied with coming to service. I want you to see yourself as a disciple who desires to serve. And you can do that by committing to the mission of now your church. I know you learned it in, in class. Our mission is very simple. It's four words, right? You remember it? All right, what's our mission, church? Our mission is to gather, grow, give, and go. We want all of our members to gather regularly for worship. Try to not miss a worship service. That might be the worship experience you need. That might be the word that you need. Then we want you to grow in Christ by committing to study the word. We want you to give to God by finding a ministry in which to join. Our church becomes smaller when you get in a ministry of 5 to 15 to 25 people. It puts you in contact and in fellowship with others. We want you to give by supporting the church, by becoming a tither, and then fifth, a fourth, go be a witness. Tell someone that you know who needs to experience the good news of Jesus Christ. Someone in your family, someone on your job. I'm going to ask uh, some of our leaders from our deacon and deaconess ministries. I'm going to grab somebody from the congregation. Amen. Come on. Come on, Brother Gary. Come on. Come on, join us and extend the right hand of fellowship to these new disciples on behalf of the church. Welcome to Mount Enon. God bless you. Welcome to the church. Welcome. God bless you. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Mount Enon. God bless you. Bless you. Welcome. Amen. She's like, Amen. My man. Good to see you today. All right. You don't mind if I put you on the spot, do you? You don't mind if I put you on the spot. He said, Pastor, I man, you've been regular at this church for how long? Man, long time. long time he said pastor but when that pandemic hit he said I kind of got comfortable at home I've been watching it every Sunday but I kind of got comfortable at home he came last Sunday he said but pastor when I got in the atmosphere last week he said oh I forgot what I've been missing praise God I want to tell everybody at home come on get in the atmosphere Praise the Lord. You're going to be blessed. It is so good to have worshiping with us today Congressman David Trone. Congressman Trone, just stand and face the congregation. So good to see you today. We just had an incredible conversation about public policy and monetary policy and his vision to address criminal, his passion for addressing criminal justice reform in the country and in our community and in our state. And uh, he's out today uh, spending time with me along with my uh, good friend, Derek Green. Good to see you, Derek, uh, strategist. And I've known since my days back uh, in Jersey. So good to see all of you and so glad to have you with us, Congressman. Amen. Well, it's giving time, church. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down, shaken together, will the Lord put into your lap, church? It is a blessing to be able to give. 
Yes, it is. And the Bible says that the Lord just loves an exuberant giver. Let us prepare to give right now. You can give online. All of you online, you can click online, give online uh, right now by going on our church's website. Church, if you have your cell phone, you can text the amount of your giving to the number on the screen. You all know there are also offering receptacles at each uh, exit as you exit the service, and our ushers will come when it is when it is uh, uh, time to give. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you today. We thank you, Lord, for being such an awesome God. You are worthy of all of the thanks, worthy of all of the praise, worthy of all of the glory. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray that you would bless every hand and every household under the sound of my voice. We believe that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. And that everything that we have, it comes from and it belongs to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Someone here today wants to praise you for being a healer, a deliverer, a sustainer, a provider, a way maker, a mountain mover, God. Someone else, God, wants to thank you for being a burden bearer, a heart fixer, and a mind regulator, God. We pray, Lord, that you would show up and show out in our lives and we'll be careful to give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Are you ready to worship the Lord, church? Come on, are you ready to worship him? Amen. We're going to worship, and I'll be right back to preach the word of God.
over the house. You can sing it. You're the God. That's right. We believe. Let me just hear the house sing it. You're the God. Anybody believe that? We believe. You're the God. We believe. Now this time, stretch your hands and let's say it one more time. You're the messages on getting control of anger yeah I want y'all to hang out with us for the next few weeks amen get got to deal with this anger thing and so there are these words there's this story recorded in John 18 It's recorded in Matthew and Luke as well but I want to look at John's account of what happens when Jesus gets arrested and it says there in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11, the following, it says that when Jesus finished praying, Jesus left his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. And on the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew that place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. And so Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. And Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it that you want? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, well, I am he. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with him. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And again, he asked them, who is it that you want? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. And this happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter who had a sword, somebody say a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And that servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter to put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Amen. My sermon really comes right there from verse 11, where Jesus commanded Peter, saying, put away that sword. 
And that's really my sermon title today. I want to talk from the thought, put that sword away. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, I know you're upset. I know you're frustrated. I know you're disappointed. But please, put that sword away. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Why didn't you apologize to Chris in your acceptance speech? Um, I was fogged out by that point. It's, 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 it's all fuzzy. I've reached out to Chris, um, and the, mes the message that came back is that uh, he's not ready to talk, and when he is, he will reach out. Um, so I will, I will say to you, um, Chris, I apologize to you. Uh, my behavior was unacceptable, and I'm here whenever you're ready to talk. Um, I, I want to apologize to Chris's mother. I saw an interview that Chris's mother did, and you know, that was one of the things about that moment. I just didn't realize, and you know, I wasn't thinking, but how many people got hurt in that moment. So I wanna uh, apologize to Chris's mother. I wanna apologize to uh, Chris's family, uh, specifically Tony Rock. You know, we had a great relationship. You know, Tony Rock was my man. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is probably irreparable. Um, I spent the last three months um, replaying and understanding the nuances and, and the complexities of what happened in, in that moment. Um, and I'm not going to try to unpack all of that right now, but I can say to all of you, there is no part of me that thinks that was the right way to behave in that moment. There's no part of me that thinks that's the optimal way to handle a feeling of disrespect or, or insults. After Jada rolled her eyes, did she tell you to do something? No. Um, it's like, you know, I'm, I made a choice on my own from my own experiences, from my history with Chris. Jada had nothing to do with it. Uh, I'm sorry, babe. I'm um, going to say sorry to my, my kids and, and my family for the heat that I brought on all of us. Um, to all my fellow nominees, you know, this is a community. It's like I won because you, you voted for me. And it, it, it really breaks my heart to have stolen and, and tarnished, tarnished your moment. Um, I can still see Quest Love's eyes. You know, it, it happened on Quest Love's uh, award and, you know, it's like I'm 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 sorry really isn't sufficient. What would you say to the people who looked up to you before the slap or people who expressed that you let them down? Um, so there's two things. One, um, disappointing people is my central trauma. Um, I hate when 
I let people down. Um, so it, it hurts. Uh, it hurts me psychologically and emotionally to know I didn't live up to uh, people's image and impression of me. And the work I'm trying to do is I am deeply remorseful and I'm trying to be remorseful without being ashamed of myself, right? I'm human and I made a mistake. And um, so I would say to those people, I know it was confusing. I know it was shocking, um, but I, I promise you, I am uh, deeply devoted and committed to putting light and love and joy into the world. And, you know, if you, if you hang on, I promise we'll be able to be friends again. <laughs> Amen. It was the slap that was heard around the world. March the 27th, 2022 was supposed to be the pinnacle of Will Smith's acting career. A night when the rapper turned actor would join the likes of Sidney Poitier, Denzel Washington, Jamie Foxx, and Forrest Whitaker as the only black actors to black male actors to ever win an Oscar for black best male actor. And Will was slated to join that pantheon for his role in the movie King Richard. <clears throat> it was to be a special night, not just for Will, but for the rest of black America. After years of protests and boycotts from people like Spike Lee and ironically Jada Pinkett Smith, this night, would feature an all-black production team headed by HBCU grad and Florida A&M alum, Will Packer. And so this was going to be a big night, a huge honor for Will, but also a major tribute to the long line of black actors and actresses, activists, and activism that paved the way and made it possible for him. And, and just like that, it was marred by one impulsive, fleeting moment as Will lost his cool when Chris Rock made that joke about Will's wife. You saw it, or at least you heard about it. Will walked up on that stage, the biggest stage in Hollywood, and slapped Chris Rock. And with a defiant posture, he, he returned to his seat, fuming, unrepentant, and uttering expletives that I cannot utter from this stage. And just like that, what was supposed to be a moment of positivity and hope, the crowning achievement of his career turned into a moment of shock and horror as the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air became a national pariah and disgrace. He lost the respect of many. He lost friends and finances, film roles, and it even affected his family. He was hit with a 10-year ban from the Academy Awards show, and it all happened because in a moment of rage, Will lost his composure and didn't control his anger. I appreciate that in this video, Will does not justify his behavior, and yet it is sad because it shows how anger, if it is not managed properly, can be corrosive and destructive to our lives. Some of you listening to me right now know what it's like to blow your top and to lose your cool. Anger is an emotion that goes all the way back to our early childhood when we didn't get the toy that we wanted for Christmas, when mama wouldn't let us have a little more great Kool-Aid, do they still drink great Kool-Aid? I digress. When we had to come in before it got dark, we would experience anger. And then that child grew up 
to become an adult and encountered circumstances and situations that pushed their buttons, got on their nerves, and pushed them to the edge. A coworker they trained got a promotion that they had their heart set on. They, they got something stolen for them or from them or someone threatened their family or embarrassed them publicly. And when that happened, they got angry. Their temperature began to boil and their hearts started racing and their fists started clenching. And the thing, church, is that anger in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It is value neutral, in fact. I would hasten to say that anger is one of the most basic human emotions that God gave us, along with joy, sadness, happiness, and fear. In fact, we learn from the word of God that God himself becomes angry, don't we? In Numbers chapter 32, verse 13, it says that the Lord's anger burned against Israel as he allowed them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and yet while anger is normal and natural church the sensations that hit our body when we become enraged with muscles tensing and jaws tightening and our inability to think about anything else if we're not careful can start to consume our lives the issue church is not becoming angry it's it's what we do with the anger that matters. It's, it's not whether we have anger, but whether the anger has us that matters. It's, it's when you have to yell and scream in order to express yourself. When you start throwing things and punching holes in walls and slamming doors and breaking dishes and pushing people and cursing and shouting at people and getting in people's faces that that is when you have an anger management problem but don't think don't think that you are exempt from anger just because you might be the kind of person who is not prone to such outward outbursts you can also have an anger problem if you weaponize your dissatisfaction by punishing people with silence without withholding communication or withholding affection or deciding that you are going to punish them and get them back. And so there are more of us listening to me right now who need to figure out how to get a handle on our emotions and our anger than we think. That's what we are left to conclude from our text today. Here, Peter, the man who became the chief apostle of the church, the man who delivered the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost, and he had an anger management problem. Here is Jesus with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. When off in the distance they see a crowd carrying swords and clubs coming to arrest Jesus, and at that moment, they must have felt all kinds of emotions, fear and worry, doubt and danger. And so when they saw that they were threatened, they armored themselves and got ready to respond. And according to Luke 22, verse 49, they asked Jesus, Lord, shall we fight now because we have brought our swords? They sensed a threat and they were not going down without a fight. That is when the text tells us something that comes over Peter and in a fit of rage, he takes out his sword and he starts swinging. It's like, it's like he walks up on that stage with everyone watching and he ends up cutting off somebody's ear. And I'm sure that Peter would say it was all in self-defense. I, I felt threatened and I ain't no chump. And you ain't just going to roll up on me without getting these uh, hands. And, and that's what people do when they feel attacked. They lash out. They, they swing back. And if it's not with physical swords, uh, then it's with words or some form of a retaliation. But the point is still the same. Uh, you are not not going to let people challenge you or confront you or insult you or question you without letting them know where you stand. And that's what Peter did. He defended his leader. He stood his ground and he did it all in the name of Jesus. And you know something, church? 
the world is filled with Christians who think that they are doing God's will by attacking people in Jesus' name. If I had a mind, I could make that an entire sermon all in itself. People think that, that being, by being bigoted and hate-filled uh, and by maligning people who are different, who have different thoughts and different views, uh, that they are justified by doing it because uh, they stand on a stage or behind a pulpit, have a Bible in their hand and a cross around their necks. Being defensive and attacking people seems to be what Peter does when he gets angry, when he feels offended or questioned. He's always flying off the handle. Peter is always losing his temper. It's what he did in John 21 when he felt insulted because Jesus kept questioning whether he loved him. You remember Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And every time Peter said, yeah, uh, then Jesus said, well, go feed my sheep. It's what Peter did in Matthew 16 when, when he rebuked Jesus for talking about suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priest. Peter, Peter's the kind of guy that's not going to keep it on the inside. But the problem is that oftentimes his anger got him in trouble and it went too far just like in this text. And some of you listening to me right now are the same way. You tend to handle differences, disagreements, and then uh, misunderstandings uh, just like Peter. Whenever you feel threatened by someone with different views than yours or whenever you feel people aren't on your side or in your corner or whenever you feel someone doesn't understand you or is not agreeing with you, you get upset. And just like Peter, you start taking out your sword and start swinging and lashing and going off on people. Whether it's when someone cuts you off while you're driving or if it's a cashier who does not give you the service you desire or if something happens that you think is wrong, you go off just like Peter. Yes, with your tongue-talking self, with your Bible app self, with your preaching self, with your church going self, you pull out your sword and just start swinging and lashing and going off on people and you do it all in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says to you what he says to me, what he said to Peter, please put your sword away. And that is the word that God has given me for someone in this house today. Put your sword away. You are on the verge of something special. You are on the precipice of something meaningful in your life. God is about to do something amazing, but you are about to throw it all away. You are about to make a big mistake because you keep allowing your emotions and your feelings get the best of you and your anger is out of control. That's what this woman named Jane discovered. She went off one day on everyone at her job because they gave a promotion that she was promised to another person. For her, it, this was a major injustice. This was unfair. She had dedicated herself to that job, working 12-hour days, coming home after her kids had gone to bed. She even missed the first day of her son, the first day of his school, because she was committed to her job. and She lost it that day. This just was not right. She was stressed out. She was lacking sleep. She was exhausted because she put work over her family, and this was not the kind of treatment she felt she desired. So she went into that office and threw everything off of her desk and cussed out all of the supervisors and gave them a piece of her mind. What she did not know is that she didn't get that promotion 
because they decided to give her a better promotion with better pay and better hours and more benefits. But after seeing her act crazy like that and because she showed her behind and after saying hurtful and harmful things that she could not take back, they released her and told her that she was no longer fit for the organization. So here she is now. She gave them a piece of her mind, but she's without her career, her salary, or promotion, and she's now at home with her kids struggling to make ends meet all because she has got to let people know what's going on on her mind. Listen, church. Jesus says to us what he says to Peter that day, that you need to learn how to keep your hands, your words, your judgment, your criticism, your neck turning, all your attitude to yourself. Push your neighbor, say neighbor, put that sword away. Anger, church, anger, church, reduces the, anger reduces the amount of blood that the heart is able to pump throughout the body. And so it hurts you just as much as it hurts the other people that you're unleashing your rage at. Anger can cause cardiac arrest and heart disease and even loss of life. So you got to get a handle on it because I don't want mismanagement of anger to block your blessings destroy your destiny and damage your future God wants to do something special in you you and you but you're gonna have to learn how to get control of your anger and if you're and the reason we need to get control of our anger is because according to this text when we are out of control emotionally we end up hurting innocent people in the process See, the consequence of Peter's fit of rage was that he cut off the ear of a slave named Malchus, who was in all likelihood in that crowd church because he was forced to be there by the Romans. Uh, Malchus was not responsible for what was going on. He didn't have a dog in that race. For all we know, Malchus was there because he was captured in warfare and he was made to participate in that mob. But Peter's lack of self-control resulted in someone being hurt who really had nothing to do with it whatsoever. And I want to suggest that Malchus represents all of those who have been wounded by us when we unleash our anger on them. Can you just see Malchus there with his ear bleeding, clutching his head like Evander Holyfield and in excruciating pain? Can you just see Malchus there? Imagine when Malchus goes home that night covered in blood and his wife's wife says, what happened to you? And he responds, a man cut off my ear. And he was a follower of Jesus. That is why you and I need to learn how to get control of our anger because quite often there's an innocent bystander who just might end up getting hurt in the process. Perhaps the innocent bystander is a colleague at work that you were mean to, or perhaps the innocent bystander is your spouse or your child or even your pet who had nothing to do with why you were having a bad day, but you yelled at them anyhow. Peter was a man of God, and yet he hurt an innocent person in the process. I saw a video the other day on Instagram a few weeks ago about a fight in a church. I saw a fight in a church service. <laughs> it occurred during the installation of the new pastor, and apparently there were two factions in the church. There was one side that wanted the new pastor and another side that did not want him, and they ended up going to blows in the church service. And as sad and as trifling as the video was, the most disheartening part to me was uh, that there were visitors who came to the worship service that day and they came for 
prayer, for encouragement, and a word from the Lord. But instead, they got caught in the crossfire. Can I ask you a question? Who's getting caught in the crossfire of your constant need to retaliate and to give people a piece of your mind and to fight. Who is getting caught up in the crossfire of your inability to control your mouth? What innocent person is being wounded and injured by the constant yelling by, uh, 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 and, and screaming in your home? Is that why? Is that why your kids don't want to talk to you any longer? Because you're always going off the handle. Is that why a certain friend does not call you any longer? Uh, to you, Jesus says, put that sword away. Keep your words, your critical remarks, those jabs that you always got to punctuate every conversation with. Keep that to yourself because you just might hurt some innocent person in the process who does not deserve that. Malchus did not deserve that. See, here's the thing, and I want you to get this feeling of anger is not the problem, but the way we deal with the anger can either glorify God or it could tear down creation. Are y'all here today? The way you deal with anger can either glorify God or it can tear down creation. Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry, but do not sin. Amen. Fighting back does not make you a man or a tough guy, brothers. And giving people a piece of your mind and always needing to have the right word does not make you right. It just makes you a difficult person. Don't be a difficult person that no one can stand to be around because you can't handle the fact that everybody doesn't have the same opinion as you. Someone is listening, and you're saying, Pastor, well, how do I do that? How do I put my sword back in the holster? Well, when I, read, when I read this passage in context, it became clear to me that there were several reasons that Peter handled his anger in this way. There were some spiritual conditions that were not present, and there were some unresolved issues that got triggered. And I want you to write them down. First of all, Peter was not prayed up. When you read the, the arrest of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, it tells us that right before the arrest of Jesus, that he's in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, trying to have a moment of prayer with Peter and the rest of the disciples. You remember, you know, Jesus comes to Peter. He says, Peter, I want you to sit right here while I pray. And three times the Lord Jesus asked Peter to stay awake while he prays and on every occasion the Bible says that Jesus prays he says amen after you will and he turns around only to find Peter asleep and it is immediately following this lack of prayer that the enemy comes in are y'all here today let me say that one more time Jesus says come on let's pray I just need you to stay awake while I pray. Jesus prays, but Peter was in the service sleeping. <clears throat> and after the prayer service, the Bible says that's when the enemy came in. Y'all missed it. Jesus says, come on now, let's get ready for prayer. <laughs> All I need you to do is to stay awake. Nudge your neighbor, say, stay awake. That was the wrong neighbor. Tell your other neighbor. Stay awake. Stay awake while I pray. And, and, and after Jesus prayed, he looks over and Peter is sleeping. And immediately following the prayer, the lack of prayer, that is when the enemy comes in and the anger takes control of Peter. I want to suggest to you that a part of the reason that Peter fell victim to his emotions was because he was not prayed up. And whenever you are not prayed up, church, that is the precise moment Y'all not here today. 
that creates the opportunity for the devil to come in. And because he slept on Jesus, he was not prepared when the enemy came in. What about you? Have you been praying as much as God needs you to pray? Have I got a witness here? You're about to go to the next level. God is about to do something special in your life. And all he wants you to do is to stay right here and to stay awake while he intercedes to the Father on your behalf. Just stay woke and pray. But not only was he not prayed up, I want to suggest that Peter was not in the word. When you read Luke's account of the arrest, it says that when the crowds came, that the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, should we strike with a sword? No, man, here. I want you to see this media team. I want you to put this up on the screen. I want you to put Luke chapter 22, 49 on the screen. Y'all turn to Luke chapter 22, 49, and then look at 50 on the screen. Here's what it says. <clears throat> I was reading this. Y'all, I like the word. Y'all, you got to like the word. I love the word. Look at it. It says, when they which were with him, that's the disciples, saw what was to follow, they said to Jesus, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? That's the question. So when I read it, I was waiting for Jesus to answer. Are y'all listening to me? But between verse 49 and verse 50, we never hear Jesus' answer. Verse 50 says that immediately... Uh, Peter takes out his sword and starts swinging at people. <laughs> and without waiting for Jesus' word, the Bible says that Peter gets ahead of God. Peter was more interested in following his flesh than being directed by his heavenly Father. And church, whenever we are filled with or fueled by, when we are not filled by the word of God to direct us, we create conditions in our lives that are more conducive to getting ahead of God. You don't ever want to get ahead of God, child of God. You want the Lord to order your steps. Have I got a witness here? Some of us are controlled by Satan because we have not yielded to the Holy Spirit. And we're under the authority of the flesh because we have not taken the time to nourish our faith. There is no way you can get the victory over the devil. There's no way you can get dominion over your emotions without the power of prayer, without the power of the word of God. And it was these two spiritual conditions, the lack of prayer and the lack of time in the word of God that produced the soil, if you will, that enabled certain seeds to be sown. I hope y'all are still writing, that, writing this down. Here's what happens next. When I read this text, church, I kept asking myself, why was Peter carrying a sword in the first place? Why didn't he have a Bible app? <laughs> why, why, why didn't he have a scroll in his bag? I mean, why was he strapped that whole time? There was no constitutional amendment at the time that gave people the right to bear a sword. So why did he have it? Well... It turns out, according to some scholars, that Peter may have been influenced by a popular sect at the time called the Zealots. Somebody say the Zealots. The Zealot party was dedicated to the eradication of the, of the Roman party. And their members, like Simon the Zealot, were often known to carry daggers with them. Uh, you might regard the Zealot party as the Black Panthers of the ancient world. They didn't believe in nonviolence, and they were willing to defend their people by any means necessary. And so Peter joined the Jesus 
First Movement because he expected a political overthrow of the, Repu of the, of the Roman party. That is why Peter left everything. It's why he left his boat, his family business, and his father to follow Jesus. And so when Peter hears Jesus talking about dying, when he hears Jesus talking about the temple being destroyed and the city of Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, Peter is disappointed. That is not how all of this Jesus movement stuff was supposed to work out. <laughs> And when Jesus did not respond to, the, to his desires the way he wanted, then Peter got frustrated. And so when Peter saw those soldiers crossing the Kidron Valley, it triggered Peter's disappointment in church. If you have an unresolved disappointment in your life, a, a circumstance will arrive, especially if you are not prayed up and in the word. If you got some unresolved disappointment, it'll get triggered by a circumstance in your life. But not only, not only was Peter dealing with disappointment, church, he was also struggling with betrayal. Can somebody say betrayal? When those soldiers crossed the Kidron Valley carrying torches and wielding swords. Leading them was Judas, y'all. <clears throat> Judas was one of his boys. And Peter must have been thinking, man, how, how you going to do us like that? We, we've shared our hopes and dreams together. We've done life together over these last three years. Uh, you know things about my family and about, about me uh, that no one else knows. You know what I've given up, Judas, just to be here. And this is what you're going to do after everything that we have experienced together. And but so because Peter had been, hadn't been praying and because it wasn't in the word, it enabled the seeds of disappointment and betrayal to be sown into his spirit and it produced the fruit of anger on that day and when he saw Judas crossing the Kidron Valley it was as if he had been cheated on he felt betrayed and so he pulled out his sword and I'm discovering church that Peter is not alone. Are y'all still here? Someone listening to me right now is struggling with the demon of anger and rage and angry outbursts and abuse because you've been ignoring your spiritual life and it has now made you a prime target for unresolved issues like disappointment and betrayal in your life. Are y'all here today? Is that why you yelled at your spouse? Is that why you struck your a child because you have not been in the face of God because you have not been worshiping God the way you desire and as a consequence something happened and it triggered your unresolved pain and your unresolved disappointment that you have got to deal with and I see it all the time I see people all the time with unresolved pain and anger just coming to work, just coming to church this morning. I saw the story about Jonathan Major, the star of Creed Three and Ant-Man and the other Marvel shows. Just yesterday or the day before, Jonathan Major, whom everybody has been talking about of late, who's an ascending actor, young black male actor in Hollywood, got arrested for domestic violence. Slapped his girlfriend allegedly because she tried to see messages on his phone and he put his hands around her neck. This isn't in, in my sermon, but I want to declare that we have got to have a zero tolerance policy for putting your hands on anybody, y'all not here today. I want to tell some man, some woman to keep your hands to yourself. There is no reason that justifies you slapping somebody for you hitting somebody, shooting somebody. And sisters, don't you put up with somebody putting their hands on you. See, so many people See, so many people dealing with 
with anger issues from men on social media today on the blogosphere who blame women in general and black, men, black women in particular for all of the problems that are going on in the world. We've got this grievance culture where angry and disappointed people are walking around with daggers and cutting people. And I want to tell you, church, that if you don't get in touch with your unresolved issues, you are going to erupt and you are going to explode and you are going to damage your future and your destiny. I read recently about how hundreds of tons of explosive, uh, explosives are being recovered every year in Europe. A few years ago, 13 bombs exploded in France alone, killing 12 people and wounding 11. And the thing about it is that these bombs were not recently launched. These are bombs that were left over from World War II. They are lethal bombs that are left over from a war that we fought, that was fought in the 40s, but they keep turning up at daycare centers and construction sites and on fishing trips. They, they are buried in the sand at beaches for over 70 years ago, and something happens today and sets the bomb off, and it starts killing people. People are getting killed today, y'all, because of leftover bombs from yesterday and can I tell you something what is true of lingering bombs is also true of unresolved issues what is true of lingering bombs is also true of lingering anger if you got some buried anger you are going to explode on people when you least expect it and when Peter saw that crowd it triggered things in him that he had not dealt with so God wants me to act what are you packing in your holster? What unresolved issues are you carrying around? Are you disappointed with what happened in your past? Are you all armored up and always ready to fight because you are angry about who was not there in your past? But God sent me on assignment to tell somebody here today that you can get the victory over every pain, every hurt, every trauma in your life I'm done I'll give you the rest next week I just want you to go throughout this week and whenever people get on your last nerve I just want you to say to yourself put that sword away push your neighbor again a third time and say put it away put it away I don't care where you learned how to talk to people like that. I don't care if you learned it from your parents or if you've seen other people in your family act like that. You are not them now. You're a king's kid. And we want to handle conflict in, conflict in ways that builds people up, not tears people down. Stop always getting frustrated all the time and stomping off every time you don't get what you want. Stop shutting down. Stop lashing out at people. Stop, stop using your mouth and your tongue as a sword that strikes a blow into the hearts of people. And learn how to communicate your thoughts and your feelings like a mature child. If you want to get the victory over anger, you're going to have to have the courage to dig deep and do the work. Can I ask you a question? Are you willing to dig deep and to do the work to discover what spiritual conditions and what unresolved issues are lying dormant under the surface of your life that gets triggered and cause you to act out in a rage? I believe that God wants you to get the victory over the anger in your life in the name of Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Listen, as we stand, as we stand, I just want to pray for someone in this house who, who, who knows, you know what, I got some unresolved hurts, I got some unresolved disappointments, you know, someone mistreated me years ago in relationship, and I realize now that I, I'm allowing that one bad relationship 
I'm allowing the disappointment and the betrayal of my last situation prevent me from walking forward and experiencing joy and peace and love again. I realize now that something happened when I was four that has stayed with me now that I'm 34, 44, 54, and I never really dealt with it. And I want to tell you that you can break the stronghold over that. Can we pray? Lord, we come before you today just to say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this word. Lord, remind us that we can get the victory over disappointment, over betrayal, over every hurt, over every pain. Help us today to break the shackles and the chains of hurt and anger that has been sown into our lives. Help us to put away the sword, whether it's a physical sword, a verbal sword, or an emotional, psychological sword that we are inflicting on innocent people. Lord, help us to pray like we need to pray. Get us in the word and enable us to wait on your direction, your word before we move. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And God, we thank you because we realize that if you could redeem Peter and enable him to become the head of the church, then there's still hope for us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we praise you today. Thank you, Lord. Heal us. If we've ever hurt anyone, let us know that redemption is possible, that healing is possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. The doors of the church are open. I want to invite someone in this house who's not saved. Listen, if you're not saved, if you've never confessed Christ, if you haven't been baptized, if you want to join this church, I want you to know that we would love to be your church. I would love to be your pastor. And so as we sing this song, I want you to come down the house today. Is there one? Come on out of the house today. Give us your hand and give God your heart. This is your time. Is there one? today. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper next Sunday and I want to encourage you to come on out next Sunday to get the second installment of this sermon series. All of our guests and visitors, come on back to worship with us again. Congressman Trone, it's so good to see you today. It's a joy uh, sharing with you. I look forward to ongoing conversation as we endeavor to make our community our state, and our nation a better place. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, we are having free and confidential HIV AIDS testing over uh, in the Harambe wing, just come out of the doors to my right and your left. It's a serious thing. Amen. Go on and do that today uh, if you need to do that to know your status. Amen. Let's look to the Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth and forevermore that all of God's people say amen, amen, and amen. Put that sword away. Put that sword away. Tell three people. Put that sword away. Come on, tell them. Tell them. Put that sword away.